we're going to be discussing uh, protecting our drinking water. So we're going to focus on uh, both well and septic systems. And um, I know some of you aren't from Minnesota, but I do want to highlight that this uh, presentation and this proposal uh, that was funded was all to educate people in uh, the, the great state of uh, Minnesota. Just trying to get my slides to advance here. All right, so the funding from this program, again, came from the Minnesota Department of Health. In Minnesota, we have something called the Clean, Clean Water Legacy, Land and Legacy, that helps fund various environmental programs, education, and research. And this is part of an outreach effort uh, to educate people about chemicals of emerging concern. So that is what we are going to first talk about, is what are chemicals of emerging concern. But we're going to spend most of our presentation time actually talking about what is a good septic system and what is a good drinking water system. And ultimately, this is all done with the goal of what you what you can do, what we each can do as citizens uh, to protect our water. So you'll see there's a fact sheet on the right of this page that was developed, a collaboration between the University of Minnesota where I work. And I should, probably should have introduced myself. I got all going really quick here. So um, my name is Sarah Hager, and I work at the University of Minnesota. I do education and research um, about septic systems. And we actually have just started doing some research as well about chemicals of emerging concern and the potential removal in septic systems. Uh, we have another expert coming in who will focus more on the well uh, aspect, and I'll let Craig discuss that a little later. But the fact sheet on the right is kind of the bullet points of today's uh, presentation, um, really focusing on what good wells and good septics and how they really do uh, protect us when it comes to chemicals of emerging concern. So chemicals of emerging concern are kind of a new topic, but they're not, it's really not new because when you look at this picture here, you'll see many things we all use every day, right? Dishwashing soap, shampoos and cleaners, pharmaceuticals, uh, you know, it shows the picture of the couch there, that would be like flame retardants. So those are things, again, that we're finding in our water that we didn't used to measure. We used to, you know, really focus on kind of the major contaminants. And we all know what a contaminant is, right? It's something that's in a place where it doesn't belong. Well, these DECs are substances that have been either found already or they're likely to enter our waters. And it's not just surface water, it's groundwater. Many of us across Minnesota and the U.S. are actually using groundwater as our drinking water source. So some of the challenges is, the first one is, with some of these chemicals, we do not have a human health-based guidance which is how much of it is safe to drink. Um, we know they either pose a real or perceived threat. And also you'll see there are new or changing health or exposure information. So we are finding out more things all the time. So this can include pharmaceuticals, pesticides, industrial effluents, personal care products. So you can see a lot of these things are things that we um, can be washing down the drain. So these new contaminants, well, why are we finding them? Well, the first one might be the most common, and that is because we can measure things at much lower levels than we used to. Historically, we usually talk about measuring things in milligrams per liter, which is parts per million, which is still pretty small, right? But now we're actually finding things at part per trillion. In addition, we're looking for things we haven't been looking before. We have new substances that are being used and old substances we're using in different ways. So I like to think about when I was a kid, right, and what we had in our medicine cabinet under our sink, and now think about it, right, how many, you go down that aisle at Walmart and how many products there are. So um, some of it is because we're using more, but then there's some things, uh, a good example would be atrazine, right? So atrazine has been around a long time. It's, you know, didn't get developed in the last five years, right? But now atrazine is something that we're finding in our groundwater, in our surface water, oh in these really uh, low amounts. So here are examples of CECs, right? Antibiotics, hormones, metabolites, psychoactive drugs, lipid regulators. And again, I'm really focusing on the ones that come out of people's homes. There are certainly others that could be coming from other sources. But uh, we have to keep in mind that many of these chemicals uh, of emerging concern could be coming out of our homes. So that's kind of the overview of CECs, but now I really want to focus on, on what is a good septic system. And we refer to those as subsurface sewage treatment systems, but rolls right off the tongue, right? SSTS in Minnesota. 
But I think the picture also is what I, another thing I want to highlight, and that actually shows that underneath a septic system, there is going to be degradation and absorption of many of the chemicals of emerging concern. Um, this is an area of certainly growing research, um, evaluating the removal. Because in the past, we didn't look at, we didn't look for these things, right? We were looking for the removal of bacteria and viruses and organic material and nutrients. But I think it is something we'll, we'll continue to learn more about how the soil itself and the microbes living in the soil assist with that degradation process. So what is a good septic system? So the first thing is, is we should never be coming in contact with sewage. So that means there won't be any backs up into a home. It will not be surfacing into the yard or connected to any sort of water body, whether that be a ditch, a river, a stream, a pristine lake. Um, the next one is, is that it have a watertight tank. So um, some of our older tanks, again, don't, aren't, aren't watertight. They were actually designed to leak and put in too deep. And the last one, maybe the hardest one to sometimes see, but it's that we have good treatment occurring in the soil. So this is, again, from the bottom of your system to a saturated zone, a confining layer, bedrock, a zone we know won't treat wastewater. That's what we're trying to protect the system um, from making sure that it's going to treat that water before it gets to that restrictive zone. So when we look at what a typical septic system is composed of, we always start at the house because this is the user, the owner, which I'm expecting many of you on this webinar are, are the people who generate the wastewater. You're also the one who puts those chemicals down the drain, right? So we're all using some. And we will later in this presentation talk about how some of those chemicals can actually cause problems or challenges uh, for our septic system. So we're going to flow from that source. And in this case, right, they, their primary treatment occurs in a septic tank. And almost every septic system starts with a septic tank because it provides really inexpensive good treatment. And in, in this case, we're going out to a soil treatment system. And this may not look like exactly what your house looks like um, and what your septic system looks like, but we uh -huh. almost always rely upon the soil to do our final treatment and dispersal. That septic system is actually recycling the water back um, into the environment so it can be used again. So here in Minnesota, we have a three foot separation to that limiting condition. So from the bottom of the system to saturated soil or bedrock, we're going to have three feet to make sure in particular that the viruses and the bacteria are removed. So I wanted to look a little bit more at that septic tank because it's such a critical component for, for us to manage. But I think to understand why it's important that we manage it, we should think a little bit about what that tank is doing for us. First and foremost, it is catching solids. So these again are many of both light solids and lighter and things that might float to the top. So it's going to continue the degradation process, right? When we eat food, our body takes energy, energy out of it and it starts to decompose it, but that's not a complete process. So the microbes, and they're actually anaerobic bacteria that live in that tank, continue that degradation process. The second thing it does is it also stores some inorganic solids, again, things we put down the drain that actually there's no way for the microbes to digest that. So then what actually happens in the septic tanks is what, what you'll notice is, is that the heavier solids settle out to the bottom, the lighter material floats to the top, so these would be soaps and greases and small amounts of toilet paper, and then what you'll see in the middle is a cleaner liquid layer. It's not clean, it's just much cleaner than what came in. The last thing you'll see, along with that kind of settling process that's going on, is that those anaerobic microorganisms are breaking down that organic material. So if any of you have ever smelt a septic tank, I think it smells beautiful. Most people don't, right? Because it smells like methane and hydrogen sulfide. So those gases are the byproduct of anaerobic digestion. That actually tells you that a tank is doing its job. Septic tanks are designed though that those gases actually vent back through your plumbing stack and come out at the top of your house. Oh, I went the wrong way. So here shows a cross section of a septic tank. Oh, it went too fast that time. And what you'll see in the septic tank is those three layers I talked about. 
But a couple other things I want to highlight in this diagram is you'll see the wastewater comes in from the left side of the, of the image. Um, that's the inlet side of the tank and that there's actually there a baffle. So the purpose of that baffle on the way in is to direct the wastewater down so it doesn't kind of short circuit across that tank. We want the effluent from the home to stay in that tank for multiple days, right? That's the detention time. Um, you'll notice there's a similar baffle on the way out of the tank. Uh, the purpose of the one on the way out is to make sure that floating scum layer sitting on the top um, doesn't go out, right? We don't want that to go to the, to the soil treatment system. A couple other things to notice about this diagram is your tank and your backyard may not look this way, right? One thing you'll notice in particular is that we have risers to grade on, the, on this tank. That is how many newer tanks are installed and it really facilitates maintenance. It's much easier to get into that tank and properly clean it when they're at grade. Yours instead might be buried 12 inches, hopefully not much deeper than that because otherwise it's a lot of work to dig that tank up um, when maintenance is needed. Another thing you'll notice that not all tanks have is an effluent screen. So on the way out of this tank, there's a screening device that further limits the solids that can exit the tank, which is they're relatively inexpensive and they're a really nice uh, benefit to add into a system. So here shows a picture of some of those effluent screens. So this effluent screen is basically going to replace your outlet baffle. Um, it must have a riser to grade because it's going to need regular maintenance. So there's different types and different sizes you can see in the diagram. Um, but basically they have these slots or louvers in them that aren't going to let larger solids pass through. So now moving on to the soil treatment system, you can see here from the bottom of our, our system to our limiting condition, which again could be saturated soil or bedrock, uh, we're required to have three feet. And some of you who may not be from Minnesota, you may have a different number than that, uh, but that's the number we've decided is, again, protective of public health and the environment. It's in our rules in Minnesota. Um, so. Uh, but what happens if you don't have three feet on site? So in those situations, you basically have two options. One would be is you could do pretreatment beyond a septic tank. You could put in an aerobic treatment unit or a media filter that further cleans up the water. Or what we also commonly do is we bring soil in. So you can basically elevate your septic system with sand, and that gives you your same separation. So we know we're protecting that underlying groundwater. And I know sometimes people are confused when they see a water table that high, but keep in mind, in many of our soils, we have a deep aquifer, which is what we're using for our drinking water source, but then commonly we'll have a perched or elevated water table much higher in the soil profile, because when it rains, that water kind of gets stuck in the soil. That water creates anaerobic conditions, which do not favor the treatment of sewage. So now we're going to look at what do we add to the water and how do septic systems treat those contaminants. So we'll first talk about the things that make us sick, those pathogens, the viruses and the bacteria. Then we'll talk about the various solids we add, um, some nutrients focusing on phosphorus and nitrogen. And finally, what about those, all those chemicals? So one thing I do want to point out, uh, the diagram on the right here, is that it is very important that all of our wastewater be connected. So you'll see the black water is what comes from the toilet, but we also have gray water coming from sinks, from our dishwasher, from our bathtub, and even our washing machines. And I know um, in some parts of the country when people first got washing machines, they often didn't connect them to the septic system because it's like, oh, well, it's clean water which you have to ask yourself, like, why do you wash your clothes, right? Because they're dirty, right? And dirty means there are pathogens and viruses and soaps, right? Um, I know there's been some research even they've looked at people's kitchen sinks and think about if you, like, clean your chicken in your, in your sink, right, there could be a lot of salmonella going down the drain. So that gray water all needs to be treated, and um, there's a good bulk of research showing that certainly the contaminant load is less from gray water, but it's still water that needs treatment. So think, looking at this picture, you can see, right, I have the one house that's kind of up gradient um, from uh, the septic system. They have their own well, and then we have someone down gradient who has a well. 
and you see the plume of water that's moving away from that septic system. We want to make sure that as that water in this case kind of is traveling laterally, someone down gradient from that is going to want to use that water. So in this case, it could be for a well, but in other instances, it might be a lake, river, or stream that we're trying to protect. But it's also very important to understand that all of our water is connected. So our septic system properly treating is very important in protecting our water resources. So then we have to ask ourselves, well, where are these things? Is it happening in the septic tank? Is it happening in the soil? And the answer is both. The septic tank does not clean up the water all the way, but it's kind of that first step in the process. So kind of first looking at the pathogens, uh, the pathogens are whatever you happen to be sick, right? Bacteria and viruses, worms and protozoa. Um, ultimately, they have difficulty living in an oxygen-rich environment. These things are coming out of our bodies from our guts, from our digestive systems, which are actually anaerobic. So when they go out to the septic tank, they don't, get, they don't die there. Where they, where they die is they have difficulty living in an oxygen-rich environment, which is what our drain field is. So they will remove, they'll die off, they'll be predated by other soil microorganisms as long as we have that three feet of treatment. So moving on to the solids, so we have two types. The first are organic. Uh, so these are digested, so things I've already consumed, right, or undigested animal and vegetable material. It can also include synthetic organic compounds. So if these organic solids reach a water body, they require oxygen to be broken down. And we can measure that in the lab. That's what the, the BOD is. But when they get to a lake, river, or stream, um, if they haven't been treated, they will take oxygen out of that receiving water body, and that will lower the water quality of that lake. So how we deal with these in a, in a septic tank is some of them are going to settle out. Um, if we put a screen on the end of our tank or a filter, that will help as well. But some of this organic material is going to get out to our soil treatment system where good soil microorganisms, and if you take um, a gram of topsoil, it has somewhere in the range of a billion natural microorganisms. So we are going to use good natural soil bacteria to con continue to eat up that organic material, and they do. When you put sewage out into a drain field, it's kind of like the honey at the picnic, right? The ants just come. Same thing with septic systems. The soil microbes grow based on how much food is available for them. Unfortunately, all the solids are not organic, so um, there can be inorganic solids. One of the biggest culprits is fibers from synthetic clothing. So think about, again, how you clean the lint out of your dryer. More than that actually comes out of your washing machine, and that's all going down the drain, right? So it also is minerals and metals and salts that can come from soil material and your plumbing and makeup. So these solids are inert and the soil can't break them down. Um, if they get to a water body, they can cause the clouding of the water, which is referred to as turbidity. And if they make it out to your drain field, they can cause the soil pores to plug. So how we deal with these again, how we treat them, is we hope to hold as many of them back either in your house or in your septic tank, and then they're removed when the tank is pumped. Here's another example where that screen or filter can really help reduce the amount. But over time, they can cause those soil pores to plug. So moving on to our nutrients. So phosphorus, again, is a nutrient that primarily comes from us, from our urine. Um, it's also present in food. And why it's in our urine is we consume things that have phosphorus in it that we don't need, so it goes out with our urine. There's still small amounts of it in some household detergents. So in oceans, um, this is different, but in lakes, ponds, and streams, when you see a green lake like you see here in the picture, the growth of weed and algae is dominated, or how much will grow is based on how much phosphorus is available. Um, and we'll talk about nitrogen and oceans coming up, but that, that's our key issue here, certainly in the Midwest. Our, you know, Minnesota's the land of 10,000 lakes. The great thing is if you have a septic system with three feet of unsaturated soil, uh, that phosphorus is going to be removed in the soil. So phosphorus has a very strong affinity to become attached to the soil um, at, if the right minerals are present. And generally here again in the Midwest, we have those soil conditions. So moving on to nitrogen, it's another nutrient that comes primarily from us, from urine and food breakdown. 
It is also present in household cleaners and chemicals. It has two impacts. The first is it has an impact to drinking water. So this would be, again, if you have a private well, uh, there's a federal drinking water standard for nitrate nitrogen of 10 milligrams per liter. And if you look at ocean environments, their growth of weed and algae is based on how much nitrogen is available. So when it comes to how nitrogen is removed in a septic system, it depends what kind of septic system you have. Our conventional in-ground systems are generally the least effective at removing nitrogen. Um, and in those instances, that's one of the key reasons why we have well setbacks. So that 50, 100, or 200 feet, whatever your setback happens to be, allows for some of that dilution. So we'll, uh, the goal will be to be at less than 10 milligrams per liter. It is also important to note that septic systems are not the only contributor of nitrate nitrogen. Right? Agriculture is another big source. So again, when you're looking at your well, you also need to look at what's going on around you, and that's something we'll talk about more coming up. Also, the last thing I want to highlight about nitrogen is, is there are advanced systems that are designed to remove nitrogen. So in areas around the coast now, in areas where we're putting in bigger septic systems and concerned about nitrate, um, those systems are often needed and required. Uh, to protect the surface and groundwater. So the last one is the chemicals. So in most homes, these are cleaners and medications, other uh, pharmaceuticals and personal care products. In large amounts, they can harm your septic system. And in particular, if they are things that are designed to kill bacteria, the, the cleaner, the chemical, the antibiotic doesn't know who the good bacteria is and who the bad bacteria is. Uh, the other real risk is we have seen impacts from some of these chemicals affecting the aquatic food chain. Um, the issues it's seen is um, it's caused species reproduction issues um, in aquatic species. And we've also found it in our drinking water. So coming out of people's taps, right? Things like atrazine are in, in some drinking water supplies. So how do we treat these in a septic system? Well, some of them could be stored in the septic tank. And then we have variable data coming in about the removal. Um, and in general, the data that's coming in is looking pretty favorable. But the bigger challenge is if we're putting a lot of these down the drain, our septic system may not be functioning properly. All right, so with that, I'm actually going to hand it over to Craig here, who's going to talk about our drinking water system. First of all, I'd like to say good afternoon to everyone. My name, as Sarah said, is Craig Gilbertson. I work with the Minnesota Department of Health, and I'm going to talk today about what is a good drinking water system. And I'm not talking about just wells. It's important to look at your system at your house as the, the entire system. A well is the probably the most important component of the system, but there are other things such as your your distribution system and your wellhead protection area that I'm going to talk about. First of all, a little background of myself. Um, I ran a county environmental health program in the great north woods of Minnesota for approximately 18 years. Then I worked for an engineering firm, and currently I'm working with the Minnesota Department of Health, and I work in the non-community drinking water unit, and I'll get into a little bit about that too. But also, I have three septic systems myself, and two wells. So I've gone through this process and I work with my wells and my septic systems almost every day. I've had to replace my personal system two times, my uh, on-site system, and now I'm on my third system at my house. So it's of great importance to me that I'm protecting the public health, but I'm, that I'm also getting the most life out of that infrastructure, my well and my septic system, because they're big investments for me. So I want to do both that. I want to protect public health, and I also want to protect my investment so I don't have to get a new one right away. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what goes on at our public water supplies, and then I'm going to take that down to your private system, what you can do. What you can do is very similar to what we do as public health professionals to help protect your system or as you'll see on the slide, to manage that risk as best as possible. So who manages the risk federally? It's the federal government. It's the Safe 
Clean Water Drinking Act. And then the state government in Minnesota and throughout the country then has primacy over that act. And that can be given primacy down to a city or then a uh, county, uh, county health department. So with a county health department, they might be looking at restaurants, schools, and churches. But what I'm going to talk primarily what I'm going to get into is how you can also do that, protect public health and protect, protect your risk. So in Minnesota, and it's similar throughout the country, we have about 7,000 public drinking water supplies. So uh, we have approximately 1,000 community water systems. So those are the systems where you see the water tower. Everybody's pretty familiar with those. It's where people live. So we have two types. We have the municipal, like a city, and then we also have the non-municipal, which might be, as it says, mobile home park or a housing development, et cetera, as long as it meets the federal definition of what is a public water supply. Then also we have non-community public water systems, and that's where people generally go. So we have, between that, we have the non-transient, which is schools, churches, and offices, where people are there almost every day of the week. Of course, they get the weekends off, but they're drinking the water on a more regular basis. And then the transient facility. So we have resorts, campgrounds, et cetera, throughout the countryside, basically. So community systems, as I said before, everybody's familiar with the, looking at the water tower for storage, et cetera, in towns and cities. In Minnesota, and again, similar across the country, obviously the numbers change, but we have, again, approximately 1,000 community water systems. And by definition, that is 15 plus connections of 25 people or more for six months out of the year. And in Minnesota, basically we have 20 Minnesota Department of Health staff, and you can see the list what that's composed of. We have district offices throughout the state, from the Twin Cities area to northern Minnesota to southern Minnesota. And I just want to say one thing. If you run across any questions, if anything comes up um, throughout the presentation or after the presentation, be sure to feel free to contact a health department official in your area. They'd be glad to talk to you about your issue or about your question. So next is the non-community water system. They, again, are public water systems. And now you're saying, well, that's the same slide. I see the water tower in the back, but in the foreground is a non-community public water supply. That little well by those two yellow posts is a non-community public water supply. And that's, this is actually in the Twin Cities area, but it is a non-community well within a community. A little bit confusing. It took me at least five years to figure out all this terminology and whatnot. But you'll see the strip mall in the background. That's what that well services, a non-community water system. It's not where people live, but it's where people go. And so there's different uh, parameters that we look for when we do our testing and our monitoring. So in Minnesota, we have about 6,000 of those throughout the state. In my neck of the woods, again, where, I'm, where I work is out of northern Minnesota, we have lots of resorts that people go to, and we want to make sure that their drinking water meets the requirements and, and is safe to drink. Also, you'll see it's uh, schools, child care offices, and factories. And again, this is serving 25 people of the same people for six months or more. That's the federal definition of what a public system is. On the non-transient, whereas the transient is 25 people for at least 60 days out of the year. So what we do to lower that public health risk is we do monitoring and testing. We also do inspection and make sure that maintenance is being performed on these drinking water systems. So we want you, I want you to think about that with your system. Just briefly, in our community systems, we look at a, a lot of different parameters when we do our monitoring. As you'll see, there's over 118 different industrial chemical and pesticides that we look for. And that list of contaminants will change based on the testing for each community, based on the results of that community, based on the risk of, that, of their wells. So it gets a little bit more customized. 
But what we're going to look at, what I'm going to talk about more today is what we look in the non-community public, non-community testing, the important things, some of the important ones that we look at and that you should also look at is bacteria, we test for coliform bacteria, nitrate, arsenic, lead, and manganese. And you'll see certified labs, very important. You want to make sure when you're doing water testing that you bring your water test in to a certified lab. So in Minnesota, all of the certified, the labs are certified by the state health department. So in addition to the monitoring and the testing, then we inspect our public system. In Minnesota, we do that once every three years. We do an, an entire inspection of the entire system. So we look at that wellhead and the area around the wellhead. We look at the distribution system. So that's the water lines going through the other cabins, et cetera, or else, and also the wellhead protection area. We wanna make sure that we help prevent contaminants getting into that well. So what can you do? Again, you can do what we do professionally. You can do it at your, you might, it won't be exactly the same, but it'll be very similar to help protect your drinking water. You can take your water, you can look it up on the website. I'll do a little advertisement for website. Uh, the Minnesota Department of Health has an excellent website from constructing a well, that's our well management unit, to protecting your well, testing your well, that's our drinking water protection division within the state. And there are many um, websites throughout the country, throughout the state that you may live in, or even the county that you live in may have an excellent drinking water protection program and may have a website. And they'll show you where you can get your water tested if you go to their website or give them a call. Again, be sure you're using a lab that is certified. And then once you've got your water tested, you should also look at your drinking water system. How vulnerable is your well? Is your well an old well? Is your well in a pit? Is your well in a basement? That all adds up to how often you should monitor your well. So as I mentioned, the vulnerability relates to the risk. What type of well do you have? Is it a deep well? Is it a rock well with a three foot diameter? Is your well casing in a basement or is it a pit? Does it have grouting all the way around your casing? As you'll see in the picture going up, that's called the annular space around the well casing. When they drill a well, there's a, they drill a larger hole than the casing to put down the casing and then that space around the casing is an annular space. And that should be grouted for extra protection of your well. However, depending upon where the state you came or where you live, that, that requirement might not have happened for a number of years. So your well, if it's an older well, might not be fully length grouted. You should also know your local geography. Are you in an area such as a karst area where contaminants aren't being filtered through the soil and they're going directly to your groundwater? So again, you're increasing your risk. And then also, be aware of what's going on in your area. Does the health department have any warnings about drinking water or concerns about drinking water in your area? Are there contamination issues in the groundwater? Are they in your area? Be sure you're knowledgeable of that. And one big thing, of course, in Minnesota, around our rivers, in the springtime especially, is, is flooding. Is your well in a flood zone, a seasonal flood zone? Is, does that contribute to potential contamination? So the pictures of the wells. Now, those would be high-risk wells. Uh, again, in Minnesota, we have a lot of lakes, and sometimes people find their, their drinking water as easy as possible. Uh, in northern Minnesota, we have a lot and have had a lot of sandpoint wells. Because of our geography, geology, we can go through the sand and pick up drinking water within 15 feet of the surface. So is it good drinking water? Is it safe drinking water? Sometimes. But again, it's a vulnerable well at that depth. It doesn't go through what we call a confining layer. So something could easily contaminate that well, such as the well next to the lake on the right. And then a worst case scenario, a flood area, that's actually a well that we saw in the field in the river. Is your well in the pit, in a pit or a basement? The screen on the left shows a wellhead that is in a pit. Yeah, not doesn't look too good contaminants could be going down that casing. It's surely not grouted. 
They couldn't get a machine in there to route around it. So anything that is in your basement around that well or in your pit, if you have those that's around that well, it's going to drain right down that casing and you're going to be drinking it. The screen on the right is a seasonal flood area. Again, is that, is that protected? Is that well fully cased? Is that flood water going directly down that casing and you're drinking it? Things to consider. The vulnerability of your well. Here comes again, certified lab. Make sure you get your water tested and make sure you get your water tested at a certified lab. So I work for public health and this is our recommendation. We always want to recommend uh, based on public health. You know, if your well you is not as vulnerable, if it's a relatively new well, it's located away from contaminants, etc. You might not have to do this on this regular of a basis, but if you have a well that is more vulnerable or if you have tests that show that you're getting contamination, you might even want to increase that to have a better idea if you need to do treatment to your well or if you need to drill a new well. At a minimum, you should do the bottom three, the arsenic, the lead, and manganese, you should do at least one time. It's a one-time test. The bacteria and the nitrate, again, based on your vulnerability, you can kind of change, skew that testing. Again, a great resource is your local health department or your state health department. They're knowledgeable of what the groundwater or surface water you're using in the area consists of, and they can advise you on how often you should do that type of testing. And I'm going to go over each of those parameters. So bacteria. Uh, we test because it's an easy test to do for coliform bacteria, total coliform and fecal coliform. Um, if you get a positive test, that basically is indicating that there is a pathway to your well for contaminants. Coliform in itself is not a harmful bacteria, but it is showing that something is getting into your drinking water that shouldn't be. Maybe you had a plumber doing some work on your system with his plumber hands and got a contaminant in it, uh, something of that nature. Again, if you do get a positive test, you should disinfect your well. And on our website, we have the, how the homeowner can do it, but I would recommend that you contact a licensed water well contractor. And I say license. In Minnesota, we license all our water well contractors. And they, I'll do a little advertisement for water well contractors. They are a great resource. They understand and know, generally know what is going on with your groundwater in that area. If there's any issues of concern or whatnot. And where I'm from, there is the well driller that I, that drilled our wells is uh, Freeman Well Drilling. They're a third generation well driller. They have records way before the state health department ever had records. And you can go back and talk to this well driller, those well drillers, and generally find out a lot of good information about the groundwater in your area or your specific well. Nitrates. Uh, Sarah mentioned nitrates. A concern in that is that anything over 10 parts per million for infants and pregnant women. Infants' guts cannot develop it, and the concern is methohemoglobinemia, basically blueberry. blueberry. Blue baby. Don't want to make a baby pie. Sorry. Uh, blue, uh, methohemoglobinemia, as I mentioned, uh, with infants. My wife is a public health nurse, and she had a baby that was, um, di was diagnosed as failing to thrive. And she, that baby was, uh, they were using formula from a sandpoint well that was 20 feet from a seepage tank, septic type of system. So in other words, as Sarah mentioned before, it was a system that had holes around it. So it was, there was directly sewage going into this well, more or less. Once my wife found that out, they, they stopped using that water, water and used bottled water for the formula and the, and the baby was good to go and, and thrive and is doing did very well. So again, with nitrates, if you have high nitrates or if you have a vulnerable well and you're showing nitrates above one part, then you, you wanna keep checking that on a more regular basis. Is that nitrate levels increasing over time? And is it above 10 parts per million? If it is, you can do a couple different things. You can get a point of use treatment device. 
So basically, that would be something that you stick underneath your sink, or in the worst case scenario, or if you feel better talking to your well driller, talking to your state or local health department, you might choose to drill a new well. So another concern is arsenic. Again, arsenic is a one-time test. Um, in Minnesota, you can see kind of where we find arsenic naturally on the map throughout our state. Um, in Minnesota, new wells uh, since 2008 have to get tested for arsenic. So if you haven't had a test for arsenic or if your well is older than 2008 or if you're in an area where they just still don't test for arsenic, you should find out about it. Is it, is it naturally in your geology, in your area? Or are you next to a post-preserving uh, officer uh, equipment or whatnot? So you want to make sure about that by doing the test. It's only a one-time test. And again, similar to uh, nitrate, you, nitrogen, you can get a point-of-use device, or you may looking, be looking at drilling a new well. So again, the health department has a great website. They talk about point-of-use uh, treatment. One of the most common ones is reverse osmosis. And Sarah's going to talk a little bit about that from a concern about a RO unit for the whole house and that wastewater going into a septic system a little bit later. But if you have a small under-the-counter, it uses only about three gallons per day. And again, as I mentioned before, the other option would be looking at drilling a new well. So lead, again, similar to arsenic no level is safe. And where does the lead come from? That's an important issue across the country. Um, they have been, lead solder's been illegal since 1985, as you can see in Minnesota. Um, some parts or components of a well might have lead in them. And again, on the, on the bottom line, talks about trade agreements, and we still might have lead in, in some components that are coming into the state. How do you know if you have lead? You don't know until you test it. Again, talking about the testing. It's a one-time thing to get it tested for, so you know that if you have lead in your system. If you have an older system, if you have older pipes in your house, what you want to do is flush your system. So let it run. As we've had health department campaigns throughout the years, let it run. You want to let that run for 30 to 60. 60 seconds, that first water in the morning. You can use the water if you don't want it to go down to your drain and into your septic system, etc. Store it in the fridge, store it in containers, and water your plants. Again, if, if you have concerns, use cold water for cooking. There would be less lead in, in that. Um, don't boil anything to think you can get away, to think you can help uh, reduce it because that's basically concentrating the lead. So again, you can use reverse osmosis or distillation. Uh, lastly, I'm going to talk about manganese. Um, in Minnesota, it occurs naturally. There is also no federal or state regulation. And one of the major concerns is infants. And also adults, but especially infants, again, because they are part of our most vulnerable uh, population, part of the most vulnerable part of our population. So again, going back to my wife and promotion of breastfeeding. If you're using dry formula or if somebody you know, somebody in your family, family is using dry formula, make sure that your tap water is tested for manganese. There might already be parts of manganese in that dry formula. One way you can reduce that is through a carbon filter, which will reduce it up to 50%. Also, water softener will do that too, but then again, you're drinking softened water, which has a high level of salt in it. So, you're monitoring your system, you're taking the tests on a regular basis based on the vulnerability of your well. Now you want to go out and inspect your water system, like we do professionally. Inspect, so you want to inspect your wellhead, your distribution, and then your wellhead protection zone and see what's out there. See what's out in your neighbor's yard. See what's out in your yard. So, the wellhead, go out and look at the well. It has an electrical connection through conduit. In Minnesota, we're already getting working on our frost seven below last week, I might add, in northern Minnesota. Oh my God, that's way too early. But that frost can shift things around. So that can crack that conduit. 
and it can have an opening that provides uh, an opportunity for bugs to get into it and go right down your well. Uh, also, wells will have a vent, and make sure if you have a vent that you can see the screening, make sure the screening is intact. You also want to protect that wellhead. Is it in an area by a driveway, by a parking lot, whatever it may be, where a vehicle or the dreaded snowplow could take that out? And because you know if it's going to take it out, it's going to be on New Year's Eve or a Friday night or something like that. And you want to make sure your casing is in, that in good shape and grading. Make sure it, the ground around the well is graded away from the well. Again, you're, you're trying to reduce that risk to your well. So here's some examples of conduit. No, the middle picture duct tape does not help at all. But that is a direct, those three pictures show a direct opening, Asian beetles. <laughs> we found many of that conduit full of Asian beetles, and that goes directly into the casing down below the surface and basically down into the groundwater that you're drinking, anything that can get into there. It's a simple fix, but how can you fix it if you go, don't go out and look at it? We see it all the time in the field. And again, I mentioned vents the, on the far right, those two pictures. The, you can see the vents coming out of the wellhead, the well cap, and that vent, eh, you can't see it too well, is intact. And so it's preventing bugs from getting into it is intact. The vent is intact and also the screen is intact. Whereas with the red colored cap, uh, that has a vent that is underneath all the way around the cap. And then the one the picture on the far left is that uh, the homeowners actually uh, rigged that and put a plug in the vent, which is not a good idea. Yeah, you need that vent to make sure that the well is operating and the pump is operating proper so that that should be that blockage should be removed and a proper vent should be put in. So as I mentioned before about protection of the casing, showing a cracked casing and showing a simple solution in the middle. That well casing is right by a parking driveway, some rocks to prevent anything from driving into it or prevent the plow from coming in and hitting your well casing. The far picture on the right is not proper prevention and we see it in the field. Uh, where that well casing is directly open and any sort of bug, bird, animal could get into that casing. So then we're going to go inside and a little bit of outside and look at your distribution system. So you're familiar with distribution systems at, at community supplies, but you have a distribution system also in your home. And you want to make sure that you have backflow prevention from any cross connections. So in other words, where a contaminant, source of contamination could be connected to your drinking water. So it may be a treatment unit. One of the most common things in Minnesota is a water softener. Where does that water softener drain when it back flushes? Do you have a boiler in your home? How is the additional water when you need more water, how is that added to the boiler system? Is there a potential, that's a cross connection. Do you, do you have backflow prevention on it? Do you have an outside hose connection? Is that the proper faucet or do you need to put a device on that hose bib? And are you maintaining your systems? Again, to make sure they're operating properly and make sure they don't backflow into your system. And the pressure tank. Make sure you're checking the pressure tank once in a while. Make sure that that is not coming on. Your pressure gauge is not going up and down. If it is, that could be showing you that you have a leak somewhere in your system. A couple of pictures. On the left is a boiler system with on top of, in the middle on top, you'll see a hose with a faucet that is directly connected to your drinking, that person's drinking water system. If there is backflow, back pressure into that system, contaminants or uh, antifreeze could be coming back into the drinking water system if they have that in their boiler system. The picture on the right is, an, is a water softener overflow that is directly connected to their sewer line, which also could be a uh, cause of backflow and getting sewer into your drinking water system. So you need to look at that. And you need to make sure that you don't have devices or situations like that. If you have any questions, talk to a licensed plumber. Make sure you understand your system where you may have cross connections and make sure those cross connections are prevented. Here's a couple examples of that is an RPZ type of device on the right screen and on the left screen, I'm going to point to it, in the middle is a double check valve. Again, 
talk to your plumber, licensed plumber, or call the health department and find out where they may be. A simple solution for the water softener, have an air gap. The air gap is the best prevention of cross-contamination, the best backflow prevention because it's not a device. It's not something that can fail. So the picture on the left is that air gap. So it's above the sewer line, whereas the picture on the far right is going directly into the sewer line. You want to make sure to check where yours is going. The picture in the middle shows that there's not really, there's an air break, but not an air gap. So if there actually was flooding water on that basement floor, it could come back into your system. Outside on the hose, where's your garden hose laid all the time? In the ground, on the ground, excuse me. You want to make sure you have backflow prevention on your garden hose and your garden connections. Those are a series of prevention devices. The faucet in the middle is an atmospheric on the top of the faucet. The green part is an atmospheric type of backflow prevention device. The ones on the right and on the left are a device that you can screw right onto the hose bit that will help prevent that or that will prevent it. And again, I mentioned before about your pressure gauge. It's a great indicator if you have a leak. Is your gauge going up and down when you're not using water? Are you seeing pressure going up, pressure going down? Could be an indication of maybe something's wrong with the uh, pressure tank itself, or maybe that you have a leak in there. If you suspect any type of leak, things of that nature, check down on your pressure gauge and, and look at it for a while. Grab a cup of coffee or a beer, whatever that may be, and check it out once in a while. Make sure it helps prevent, helps tell you that you might have a leak because then that's going into your septic system that Sarah's gonna talk a little bit more about the details and it can add up. And it's not good for your septic system, it's not good for your treatment units, et cetera. Make sure you look at those devices and follow your manufacturer recommendations. Make sure you clean them out and replace items, especially like on a carbon filter. Make sure the salt is in the brine tank. Is the brine tank clean? Another thing, if you have an older house and you have pipes that are no longer being used, we classify those as dead end pipes. Make sure you remove any, or have your plumber remove any dead end pipes. They can harbor bacteria, you get backflow in your system, that can do a flush suddenly, and then that bacteria, et cetera, you're drinking it. Again, so make sure another good step is to remove any dead end pipes. Lastly, I'm gonna have you go out in your yard and look at that wellhead and look around. Are there things that you can manage? Are there things that you can remove that are surrounding your wellhead? So we call that wellhead protection. We call the wellhead protection zone. And again, you wanna see what's out there. This isn't something you have to do on a regular basis, but at least one time for sure, and maybe once every few years, make sure something hasn't been moved there, something hasn't changed. Again, horses, animals next to the wellhead, not a good thing, especially with that end of the horse looking right over that wellhead. Make sure you look around and change situations like that. Also look at your neighbor's yard. Have a discussion if your neighbor is close by. You wanna protect, the groundwater is everybody's. You wanna help protect it from with each other. If you have unused wells or abandoned wells, make sure you look at those and look at those getting sealed. In Minnesota, we have funding through our local soil and water agencies of up to 50% uh, to seal those wells. And people in other states might have similar types of programs. Check with that. So again, abandoned wells on the left. Maybe there's one of those newfangled toilets in the middle next to your well. Or maybe on the right, there's gas storage right next to your well. Uh, leaking gas, obviously not a good thing to get into your well. Move that. So I mentioned before, there might be abandoned well uh, ceiling funds in Minnesota. There is a 50% cost share grant. Check with your local soil and water office if they have that program. If they don't have that program, tell them they should get that program. It's an important program. So lastly, as again, as I'm talking about your wellhead protection zone, uh, here shows the map. Again, going out, standing by your well, looking around through your yard, through your neighbor's yard, what is in that wellhead zone? Are there practices that you can change, fertilizing your lawn next to it, et cetera, to help protect your well and protect your drinking water? And I'm gonna turn it back over to Sarah. 
Okay, thank you, Craig. And I don't think I thank you all in the beginning, but thanks for taking your afternoon to talk about uh, about water topics that uh, both Craig and I feel really passionate about. So we're going to kind of wrap up this presentation uh, talking about what you can do to keep your good septic system. So we talked about what one is, but as homeowners, we have a lot of ability to impact how our system works, how our system performs um, over the long term. So. So we're first going to discuss septic system maintenance, and what you'll see here in the picture is, again, we have a, a pumper truck, right, that is coming out to a site to uh, clean out a tank. So maintenance is mandatory. So it may vary based on your jurisdiction, ex exactly how that is enforced, but during your service visit, they are going to clean the tank, and some of you may have multiple septic tanks. They will clean your effluent screen if you have one of those. They should also confirm that your alarm is working. So any system that has a pump in it, including those mound systems I showed earlier, that pump has floats, and those floats and eventually um, tell the pump when to turn on. Well, at some point in time, that pump will fail, right? A typical pump lasts 10, 15 years, uh, but the there's an alarm float that will say, oh, the water level is getting too high, and I would rather find that, that that alarm's not working, not when my pump fails. So it's a really good thing for them to confirm that your alarm is operational. And then they should walk out over your drain field or your mound area to evaluate, have there been any changes? Are there signs of problems um, at that time as well? So here is a device to measure sludge and scum. So kind of the, the terminology we often use, we call it a sludge judge. It is a clear a uh, poll basically that will bring up a profile of your tank that then will tell you, if you remember the picture earlier of the septic tank, how much sludge is sitting on the bottom and how much scum is there. We don't want those to get too thick because if they get too thick, we may end up sending solids out to our drain field. So when they do that service visit, uh, they sometimes will have to do what you see here in the picture, which is actually dig up the manhole. Um, their goal is to, as much as possible, remove the accumulated sludge and scum. And it doesn't, when we say clean, it's not crystal clean, right? They're getting most of that stuff out. So here again in Minnesota, that is done by a licensed and bonded professional. So that's, re in, uh, according to the MPCA, those people are referred to as maintainers. Um, it, and it isn't as simple as just putting the hose down there. In this picture, he's actually got a pry bar that he's pushing the sludge and scum across the bottom to try and produce the sludge, right, that heavy stuff, to try to get that in there. And um, there's even a device that kind of looks like a blender for your septic tank that they can make it into a slurry. But it is, um, it is something that, again, does definitely take some, some effort to get clean. So it is very important that when they clean your septic tank, they do it through a manhole. So here you can see in this picture uh, the tank lid is actually coming to grade. And you'll also notice there's a lot of straw around this tank. So those of us who live in a colder climate, many people will um, insulate some of their components. So straw is one way to do that. Well, some of our newer systems will actually bury insulation um, right over the top of the tank. Um, I know there are actually even as well kind of blankets you can put out. And not everybody needs to do that. Some people can easily make it through winters and not have freezing problems where other people will. So it really um, depends on many factors, which we'll talk a little bit later about freezing. Um, and the other, the real reason it's so important to clean through those manholes is there is no way to get the tank clean. So in this picture, you'll see those smaller diameter um, accesses. Those are usually six inches, sometimes even as small as four. So uh, a six inch in particular, a four inch hose can fit in, right? But it actually can't get the tank clean. It would be like trying to change your oil through the dipstick. The next thing you should see it that should be part of your visit is a report. Now this is not a report that goes to the county or the state. It's a report that goes to you as the property owner. I like to think of it like when you get your oil changed, you know how they give you the 20 point inspection. Well, the last time I went in and got my oil changed, the guy's like, you really need new tires. And I'm like, really? Because I never look at my tires, right? And he went over and showed me the tread on it, and he's like, yeah, before winter, you really need some tires. And so then I did. Then I was able to kind of plan for that and budget for that. Kind of same thing with, with, the, um, with the septic maintainer, is that um, you should, again, give you, he or she should give you a report. 
the date, how many gallons removed, are there any issues of leakage, how did they remove the septage, where did they take the septage to, um, any safety concerns with that maintenance hole, and that's a very important point that when those lids are at grade, you have to keep in mind that a typical tank has four to five feet of liquid in it. So unfortunately, every year or multiple times a year, I hear about a child drowning in a septic tank because that lid wasn't safe or secure. This last, in the last couple of years, that happened along the North Shore um, here in Minnesota. And it's heartbreaking to think about a child drowning in a septic tank. But I think often property owners don't understand that that is, there's a huge safety risk there. And I think the last part of this is, is also very important. Um, is there any troubleshooting or repairs that either were conducted or need to be conducted? So what if that baffle fell off, right? What if that baffle isn't there? That's something that has to be fixed. And as a property owner, you would want to know that. So I actually suggest that the next time you have your tank pumped, you be home, that you actually talk to the person about what is the right interval for you to pump, how much sludge and scum were, was actually in your tank. So while we're on it, I often get the question of, well, when they pump that tank, where does it go? So this does certainly depend on where you live, but a majority of it is actually land applied following federal EPA requirements, although some is taken to wastewater treatment plants. You'll see when it is applied to the land, it requires it to be limed to raise the pH. It has to be applied at rates that the vegetation can use the nitrogen. There are many setback requirements, and then there's restriction on the crop that's grown there. So it is a very regulated process. And I know I've seen people who make a face at me when I say it's land applied. But keep in mind, the other option is, is that septage goes to a wastewater treatment plant. And as part of the wastewater treatment plant process, they develop biosolids. And a majority of those biosolids, do you know where they go? They go on fields. So one way or another, I, I like to say some of your septic is going to end up on the field. It kind of depends as it go through that wastewater treatment process first. But if it's done safely, we're actually recovering those nutrients and using them again uh, to grow um, crops and vegetation. So they'll probably, if we have a screen, they'll for sure clean it. And a lot of us probably don't. They've been something that's gotten more common in the last five or ten years. But when they clean the screen, or if you were to clean your own, it's always very important that, of course, you wear gloves, right? But that you're cleaning that off directly into the septic tank. And it's actually done at the front end of the septic tank um, so that those solids you're washing off don't go right out to the drain field. There are even some screens that have um, a protection device that doesn't allow um, effluent to go out during the cleaning process. So how often do you need to have your tank cleaned? And the answer really is it depends. Because you can think about it. It's just like, you know, your oil changing, right? So, you know, if you drive a lot, you have to change your oil a lot more. Well, same thing with your septic system. If you use it a lot, if you have a lot of people living in your house, or you have habits that put more solids down the drain, um, your sludge and scum may get thicker quicker than one person living alone in a, in a system that was designed for six people, right? So it is dramatically impacted by water and product usage. So here again in Minnesota, the maximum time period between evaluation, and again, it either could be cleaned at that three months or three year, or it could be evaluated. And when I say inspected, I'm not talking about for compliance. I'm talking to determine if it needs cleaning at that time. I will say in many parts of Minnesota and the U.S., it is very common when someone shows up with a pump truck that they are going to clean out your tank, that they're not going to measure the amount of sludge and scum. Um, and that's particularly in areas where it's relatively economical to get tanks cleaned, but you could. So that's something you may consider is actually having your tank evaluated to determine if it needs pumping at this time. So the general rule of thumb is that your system should be looked at every one to three years. This is true of seasonal homes and cabins as well because as I mentioned, what if your baffle fell off at year two, your outlet baffle, and during that time, scum was going out to your drain field? That is, oils and greases and soaps could plug up your soil treatment system. So we do want to do that check at least every three years to look for other issues besides just pumping. Also, keep in mind, if you happen to have a new home or you're going through a remodel, that there is a lot of construction debris that goes down the drain that could be harmful to the bacteria in the, in the system. And it's also a good way and a good time for education. 
um, during that service visit, you can talk to the maintainer about how does your system look. They could identify if there are things going down the drain that shouldn't be, things along those lines. So what about all these additives on the market? So if you go to your local hardware store, your big box store, you'll see numerous products being marketed to help septic system performance. Unfortunately, there's no research that supports that any of these products are beneficial. So you can see they're advertised in different ways. Uh, the first one is they're a starter. Well, the fact of the matter is a cup of sewage has somewhere in the range of a million to a billion microorganisms in it. There's a lot of bacteria in our wastewater that comes right from us. There's bacteria everywhere, right? So the next one is it's a feeder. So we give the feed, right? That organic material that comes out of our homes is all the food the microorganisms need. And the next one is probably the most concerning. It's products that say if you use this, you won't need to pump your tank. And, and again, in Minnesota here, we actually ban the use of these products because we are particularly concerned that if you put these in, that the sludge and scum that would otherwise accumulate in your tank may be going out to your dispersal system. So uh, we just recommend to people to not use these products, that sometimes you might just be flushing 20s, which is a waste of money, and you're better off using that money to just have regular maintenance, but they can actually damage your soil treatment system. There's also other, what I would say are kind of old wives' tales, things like yeast, chickens, cabbage. Someone once mentioned a goat to me, which is even crazier. But ultimately, none of those things need to go into your system. I always say, like, yeast does some of my favorite things, right? Bread and beer. And it doesn't want to live in a septic tank because if it did, it would be there. Because, it, you know, I mean, I'm sure you've all heard of, you know, um, sourdough bread, right? Uses natural yeast. Yeast is out in the environment. So if it, again, wanted to live in a septic tank, um, it would. So that pump tank should be looked at during a service visit. Um, and the key thing they're looking at when they look in that pump tank is when that pump needs to be replaced, can it be? So let's say that's on December 25th and we have three feet of frost in the ground. We want to make sure that that pump is accessible for replacement, that it's elevated off the bottom, it's working, and that it's alarmed. During that visit as well, they uh, should look in that pump tank to determine if it needs to be cleaned. We hope to not see sludge in that tank, but it can happen over time that a sludge will carry over to the pump tank itself. So how would you go about hiring a septic professional? So certainly uh, word of mouth and referrals is a great technique because now you have someone that someone else has done work for that they trusted and they thought they did good work. Um, you can get a, a, a list of licensed professionals from many of the, your counties where uh, you live, or you can go to the MP, MPCA website. And even if you simply here in Minnesota Google MPCA SSPS license search, uh, it'll bring up the search tool for you. And then keep in mind though that that list is organized by the county that the professional lives in, and um, they all work in multiple counties. So you don't want to just look in your county, look in neighboring counties as well. And then I would talk to them. If you don't have any personal experience, you should ask them questions, right? Do they pump through a manhole? Do they have a sludge judge? Do they back flush? Do they recommend additives that would get at, are they going to, are they going to do the service that you want? Instead of the last question, which is one most of us start with, right? How much is it going to cost? Well, sometimes the difference might be $20, right? So if you pay $20 less and they pump through the inspection pipe, was it worth it? I can tell you the answer is no, because they're going to leave behind the sludge and scum, which is what you hired them to do. So that soil treatment system needs very little maintenance, but if that cap got hit right by the lawnmower or it's cracked, um, that's something that should be replaced. You should keep an eye on when we get rainfall or when the snow melts, where does that water go? It should all be shedding away from the drain field, unlike the picture you see here, right, where it's sitting over the top of it. And you also just want to keep an eye on it. So it's just looking at it, and some of us can see our septic system every single day when we walk out onto our yard, but sometimes it can be kind of hidden and out of view, and that's when it's really good to just walk over to that area and just make sure that there aren't any spongy spots, there's not water sitting on the system, there's no gophers, right, um, digging around in the soil, any other sort of soil vermin. So a few other things about the soil. 
Compaction is very bad for our septic system, so you want to keep traffic off. And particularly the traffic we're looking at is vehicles and large animals. So again, things like horses, cows, you wouldn't want to put the salt lick for the deer out over the septic system either. Um, that those animals and vehicles have a very high pounds per square inch, which pushes out the airspace. Um, in the soil pores. And that airspace is good for lots of things. It's good to move water, it's good to treat sewage, and also when you have compacted soil, the frost goes down deeper. So there's a lot of bad things about compaction. If you have inspection pipes sticking up, you know, a foot, two feet, three feet in the air, those can be cut flush. Um, after, you know, the installation is kind of settled in, we do want to know where they are, but we don't need to have them sticking up high. Uh, the last thing is if you have a newer mound or pressure system, you may also have cleanouts. These cleanouts are to actually flush those laterals, um, and this can be done at the same time that the septic tank is being cleaned. So what should you gr grow on top of your system? Um, again, we generally recommend that you grow a plant that, does, that prefers dry soil conditions. So turf grass is the easiest thing for, both, uh, for most people to manage. Um, uh, and because we're looking for things that are dry, it's because we do not want to irrigate out over the drain field. Um, there's a lot of water going out there, so we, um, again, and we also don't want plants that have a really extensive woody root system. So keep in mind, the larger the plant, the more extensive the root system is. Uh, we do not recommend planting edible plants such as vegetables and herbs because they'll need to be watered and they will leave uh, the soil bare. The last thing is you should never plant anything woody over the top of your drain field. So this would be trees and shrubs uh, right across the top of the soil dispersal system. It isn't a bad idea though to have trees around the system so you can frame the system at a distance, but only non-woody plants on the system itself. So trees should be planted at least 20 feet away from the edge of the system. Trees that are known for seeking water reservoirs, such as poplar, maple, willow, and elm, should be planted at least 50 feet away. And you may have one that's closer than that, right? You may have an existing system, and that's okay. I wouldn't be cutting down the tree unless it's causing uh, huge problems for you. And if you have tree root issues, you're better off figuring out how is the tree root getting into your pipe or into your tank versus cutting down the tree. Uh, we do also have a really good fact sheet on our website that discusses other landscaping options. So often when I say, you know, we can't drive across it, well, we need to mow it, right? So a riding lawnmower is okay, but once we move into vehicles, right, that's where the pounds per square inch is getting too high. So other problems, right, the coffee can covering the inspection uh, cap, four-wheelers, ATVs, um, snowmobiles, right? The picture on the top right, you'll see a drain field that isn't growing any vegetation, so that's much more likely to have freezing problems. It may be compacted. Um, they could have erosion across the top, so numerous challenges there. So I did want to touch on freezing because it's a common question that people have, and you know, I've been at the U now 20-ish years, and in that time we've had two or three winters that were really hard, I would just say on infrastructure, including septic systems. Mm -hmm. So during those winters, we generally see a bigger problem because we don't get any snow. So that is one thing about Minnesota is we can have those winters where we may have a couple inches and it can get 30 below for an extended period of time. So that lack of cover is a problem. Um, so you can see in this picture, they put straw bales out, right? That can help, but other causes can be compaction, irregular system use, leaking plumbing, cold air getting into the system, poor drainage. All of these can exacerbate freezing. Because when we have those winters where we have freezing, it's not like every system freezes, right? It's hit and miss. And so you want to figure out why your system froze. So sometimes it'll be because you have a belly in a pipe, right? That water is sitting in that pipe. And if you have that, eventually a cold climate will catch it. So you'd want to fix that because the alternative is, is you have to use your septic tank as a holding tank. They can try to thaw and jet out systems, but often the system will refreeze without fixing the problem. So we have a great fact sheet on our website about this, 
but just a couple ideas. One would be letting the vegetation grow longer, so maybe stop mowing at Labor Day. Um, and some people will even grow a pretty heavy, tall grass over that, which is fine. As long as you can stay on top of it, don't let it grow trees and brush, right? All the other things we talked about. So you could add mulch or styrofoam. You could use extra warm water. Certainly fixing leaf. Uh, and on the leaf end, I also want to bring up high efficiency furnaces. They also um, can add, a, uh, particularly if you leave for the winter and you, uh, you know, for a couple of weeks even for vacation and you leave that on, what will happen is, is you'll have that condensation slowly traveling through the pipe um, and it can freeze. So kind of to wrap this up, we're going to go through people's homes and think about ways that you can better manage your system with the goal of extending your septic system life and protecting the environment. So the first thing is, is to think about your water usage, that the less water that goes out, the more detention time you're going to have in your tank, in your soil treatment system. Also think about how you use water. So all of our systems have a design flow. They were designed for so many gallons per day, but that is a peak loading. That should only happen maybe when you have Christmas dinner or graduation, right, when you have a lot of guests. That's not something the system can handle every day. Also, you want to think about the products you are using, right? All those things that are going down the drain and really limit them to the amount you need to keep your, your house healthy and clean. Um, never use your system as a garbage can. And this is one of my favorite recent stories is I was traveling and I was in Virginia and I was waiting for my Uber to come pick me up and I was standing next to the, the bellhop and he asked me what I was there for. And so I told him and he's like, well, if you could teach me one thing, what would you teach me? And I would say, well, it's that you don't use your system as a garbage can. And he looked at me, and he's like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, well, you know, wipes and other things that may go down the drain. Um, and at that point, he goes, oh, no, it's okay. I buy the flushable wipes. Right? I hope you're all groaning out there. Because ultimately, right, that word flushable on something, all it means is it's going to flush. It's going to go down the toilet it's going to accumulate in your septic tank and now you're going to have a tank with a bunch of wipes floating in it. So the last thing, and what we'll talk more about some of these is, if you have a problem, call your service provider. Don't wait for sewage in the basement, right? Or effluent out in your yard. I remember when I bought my first home, there was a water heater in it. And as I was getting my home inspection, the, um, the inspector said, well, you, he looked at it, he goes, you know there's a date on your on this water heater? And I'm like, oh. And I'm like, what year was it? And it happened to be the year I was born. So let's just say that water softener had, or, or water heater had seen its useful life. And you guys all know what happens when a water heater fails, right? Right? You have water all over your basement. So do you think I fixed it, right? Did I replace it or did I wait for it to fail? But most of you don't know me, so you probably can't answer that. But I actually replaced it, and part of the reason is I have a nephew who's a plumber, right? So I got a good deal on it. Uh, so ultimately, but think about septic systems. When that fails, we're not talking about water in your basement, right? So it's something that's better to be proactive about. So what about all these products we use in our home? Are they all a problem? And the answer is no. We're particularly concerned about anything that is designed to sanitize or kill, that will kill bacteria. Because those things, again, don't know which bacteria to kill. It, they kill indiscriminately. Also, we're concerned about anything that can lower or raise the pH in the tank. And it is surprising to me, but it is reported that 75% of American households either are using antibiotic soaps or wipes. So that means that stuff is going down the drain. And when we troubleshoot a system that's having a problem, it's not usually just one product. It's the cumulative effect. Uh, that they have on system performance. So why can't we label products? Well, we do, right? Products do have labels, but not for septic systems. So you'll notice that um, it starts with things that, for instance, will have a caution sign on them that means one ounce to a pint might be harmful. And they're talking about causing sickness or illness, where we can go all the way down on that list, and it could have a danger symbol on it. So when I was growing up, we grew up with somewhere that had very, um, a lot of iron in the water. So our sinks and our toilet bowls will, would all turn red. So we used a product called Iron Out, and it was magic. You put it around the sink bowl, and it would just kind of melt away the iron. The problem with the product was is you didn't want to smell it, 
you needed to wear gloves and you didn't want it to touch your skin. And those are the kind of products we don't want to put in our septic systems because they are very, we, I, I had to put a Mr. Yuck symbol on it because right, I was going to the emergency room if I swallowed it. So both for our septic systems and for our health, we want to choose products that are less toxic, uh, that will have less of an impact on our septic systems. And that's what it comes down to. If you're using a product that has a danger symbol on it, it means the chemical will kill the bacteria. So we will want to minimize or eliminate the use. If it just has a warning, in small amounts, the product very likely will not harm our system. And if it has a caution, the one I always like to think about is like cleanser, right? I, you know, I find that most of my cleaning, if I need a little bit of an abrasive that really does the job, it means that the product will have very little effect. And if I ate a tablespoon of cleanser, what would it do? Would it make me feel sick? Probably. Would it kill me? I don't think so, right? So how uh, we're gonna look at kind of what's going on in the home. So the first question is about water usage. So here in Minnesota, we use 150 gallons per day per bedroom. That assumes two people per bedroom. So for most homes that overestimates the amount of people living in the home, uh, but ultimately we don't know how many people are gonna live in the home, right? So uh, we design for kind of what the maximum occupancy of that home is. And, you can run into a home with multi-generational households living together where they may be, they may have, right, seven people in a three-bedroom home, but that's pretty rare. Mm -hmm. So the uh, average person does use somewhere around 50, 60 gallons a day, but keep in mind there are certainly people using less at 20 or 30, and then there's people who are using 80 or 90. So our codes generally use somewhere in that 60, 70 gallons per person. So if you are a typical person, that's 28,000 gallons of water a year, which sounds like a lot of water to me. And then take our house with three people in it, right? That's 82,000 gallons of water in an annual basis. Now think about the size of your drain field. That's a lot of water, right? And that's what's really amazing about the soil is that it cleans up the bad stuff and it recycles this water back into the environment. And now take 250 homes in a township. If you add those all up, that's 20 million gallons of year, a year. So that's why it's so important that our septic systems be adequately treating the contaminants. So where do we use this water? And again, this, is, uh, this data is a result of a recently published study that came out in 2016. And this study did show that we're using less water. Um, but interestingly, we're not flushing our toilets less. We're not doing less laundry. But what's really changing is our appliances are using less water. So you'll see our bathroom is our number one water user with the toilet followed right there with by bathing, then laundry, and the one that's always still kind of surprising to me is how many leaks. So this could be the slow leak, and if you ever wonder if you have a slow leak in your toilet, you put a drop of food coloring in the back and see if you start to see that color on the bottom. It's not always the big obvious leak, right? When, you, when it's running, or there you're going to use a lot of water. But all those leaking faucets and fixtures um, are, 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 part of the, are, are part of that. And then you'll see the last one here being uh, in the kitchen. So I want to start with that bathroom and the toilet. So if there was one thing that would dramatically cut back on any given home's water use, it would be to replace toilets. So if your bathroom looks like this, it might be time for a remodel, right? You might be using five or six gallons every time you flush. So now, uh, 1.28 gallons per flush or less. I actually just installed some new toilets in my house where now we have a dual flush. And I was surprised they're not m that much more expensive. So you know, you can probably get a toilet for around 100-ish bucks, right? And so you know, for 150 or 180, you can get a dual flush toilet. So then when you just have urine, it's 0.7 gallons of flush. But the other big issue with toilets is those gaskets everyone's gasket will fail and need to be replaced, right? And you don't need to replace the whole toilet. It's a relatively simple process of fixing that gasket. So it's 100% tight um, and, and or if you have the one where you have to jiggle the handle just to get it to seat, that's a lot more water that's going into the system. So what about cleaning that toilet bowl? I myself find that the brush does it most of the time. Certainly your dog is not a good toilet bowl cleaner, right? I have a St. Bernard, if he does that, the seat is just covered with slobber. So you have to clean after he would uh, go to the toilet bowl. 
So one of the things we do want to avoid is automatic toilet bowl cleaners. So in the old days, and I still see these, right, they would make the toilet bowl blue, right, every time you flush. But now they even have a gel that every time you flush, it sanitizes it. But that's constantly sanitizing your septic system, too. And I always think, what are you going to do the next time you go there, right? Why does it need to be that clean? But what it's trying to avoid is at my house, about every three weeks, I start to get this little pink sheen around kind of the top of the water line and some sort of bacteria that's growing in my house. So if you're sanitizing it, that stuff wouldn't grow. But like I said, with either the brush or a little bit of Bonami or a cleanser in your toilet brush, that, that does the job. So um, if you have issues um, with lime and hard water deposits, uh, hot vinegar uh, can work well with, again, some scrubbing. Uh, to get that off. So what should go in the bowl? Just toilet paper, right? What you put in it in toilet paper. And really there's not a big difference on all the toilet papers out there, whether you use the cheap single ply or the Charmin Ultra Ultra, right? Uh, they all break down. And if you ever want to test, you just put it in a jar, shake it, and the toilet paper will be breaking down and that kind of simulates what happens when it flushes. That's what we want to happen. So you want to avoid lotions. You want to avoid all wipes. I don't care if they say they're flushable. They do not break down and they just accumulate. So nothing else. No Kleenex, Q-tips, cigarettes, hair, cotton balls, wipes, you name it, right? And certainly not unused medication. Uh, that used to be a very common practice when people didn't use medicine. Uh, they would be told by their healthcare professionals that that should be flushed down the drain to avoid someone coming in contact with that. But um, now um, almost all counties and states have um, a location you can drop that off. And if you don't know where yours is, you can certainly contact your county environmental services or planning and zoning. Um, I've seen a lot of them end up being uh, where the cops are because they're controlled substances. So um, I was just at one that was kind of cool. It kind of looked like a... Um, a mailbox because you could open it up and put something in but you couldn't get out so they often will have um, drops um, like that to take those back. So what does septic safe mean? Absolutely nothing. Right? Even if something is mar marketed or marked as septic safe, do not flush them. So for example, some wipes, toilet bowl seat cleaners, and even kitty litter can be labeled that it's flushable. All it means is that it's flush. It will flush. Um, I've even seen toilet paper that says it's septic safe. I have no idea what that means. It is simply marketing. So uh, the rest of the bathroom bathing, you certainly want to fix leaks. Using low flow fixtures will use less water. Avoid the daily cleaners. So they do now have shower sprays or there's one where you push a button when you get out and it sprays down the shower. And this is to avoid, again, build up, right? People don't want to clean on a regular basis. So this is kind of cleaning every day which is hard on your system. So you do want to avoid antibacterial soaps. So these are soaps, again, where an antibacterial product has been added. Um, limit oils, creams, petroleum products. And I didn't say you can't use them at all, but it's just like you don't want to be pumping oil every day into your bath. Um, and in general, we recommend using bar soap because you use a lot more liquid. And soil has a strong affinity to uh, attach uh, soap to it, and that will build up in your drain field over time. And again, it's not something that's going to cause your system to fail tomorrow, but when we look at long-term failure in systems, um, soaps can be part of, part of that equation. So when we look at antibacterial soaps, um, ultimately these chemicals do kill bacteria and microbes, but according to the American Medical Association, they are no more effective at deactivating viruses than any other kind of soap or detergent. And unfortunately, they also kill non-pathogenic bacteria. So they kill the good bacteria too. So they affect the biology of your septic tank. So what do you do with those drains? Well, first you want to catch as much of it as possible. Um, often what clogs a lot of sink drains is hair hair that then catches soaps and greases and all of that. So putting in some sort of really good catch basin in your drain. And when it does drain or plug, it's usually right under the sink. So you can just take apart that um, or use a plunger or a small snake. Um, and sometimes you're going to have to call a professional. If that plug is further down the line, then you can access. 
Um, there is a DIY solution you'll see. Um, that will work for kind of soaps and greases, but it won't work well if you have a lot of hair in your line because that's more of a physical um, obstruction. Often what people do is they use a product, something like Drano, but Drano is very hard on a septic system. There was actually a study done in Arkansas where they found the typical amount that's of, of, of a Drano product that was used killed off all the microorganisms in the septic tank. And they will come back, but it takes time, right? It takes, you know, very likely weeks for the microbes to get reestablished in your system. So moving on to laundry. Next time it's time to purchase a new washing machine, I strongly encourage you to either purchase a front loading or, or front loader like you see here in the picture or an efficient top loader. Uh, they use 65% less water, so you can see somewhere in the range of 12 to 20 gallons, where the older ones are using like 40 gallons. And they do get your clothes drier too, so you actually, in the long run, they pay for themselves because they are more expensive um, than uh, regular uh, washing machines. The other thing to do is think about when you do your laundry. You want to spread it out. And this is something in the city you don't have to worry about, right? Because you're, when you do laundry, isn't when your neighbor does laundry. But if you have Saturday laundry day where all the laundry for the week from your whole family gets done, that's a big, that's a big hydraulic load on the system. So you're better off doing a couple loads a week. And even if you can, maybe do one in the morning before you go to work and one at night, that would be ideal. But even again, if you're doing two at night, that's not the end of the world. But if you're doing 10 on Saturday, that can put a, a big hydraulic load on your system. Another thing to consider adding is a washing machine lint filter. So when you wash clothes, it releases a lot of lint, much of which is inorganic. Uh, we're, we wear a lot more products that contain uh, microfibers that are synthetic. Uh, there was actually a study done by Patagonia on their, on specifically on their uh, jackets, and they found one load had 100,000 microfibers. And so where are those? And the concern is they're little, right? They're micro. So I am worried, and I, I don't have a lot of research on this, I wish I did, but some of those microfibers might be kind of floating their way through the tank and making it out to your soil treatment system. So you could try a really easy solution, which is a screen or pantyhose on the discharge line. I don't know how long you'll do that because that's going to fill up that one you see there in the picture, probably every load, maybe every other load. So, and that doesn't look like fun to take apart to me. Um, there's a couple of products out on the market that are uh, designed to, um, uh, to catch the lint. So the one you'll see here in the picture, the septic protector, the Filtrol product, it's actually a Minnesota um, company, um, and I don't work for them or anything like that, but it's just a, it's a canister that catches it, so then you put the canister, the, um, the lint that it catches in the garbage, right? Now you don't run that down the drain, obviously. So here is the problem with Saturday laundry day. And it's not just the laundry, because think about the people who are doing Saturday laundry day, they're probably at the same time showering, using their dishwasher, right? All kinds of water usage going on. If there's a lot of water that's coming in in a short period of time, it can cause turbulence, which can cause the scum and the sludge to travel out to the drain field. So what kind of soap should you use? Um, in general, you want to limit the use of bleach. So bleach is a sanitizer. So it'll kill bacteria. And it's not that you can't ever use it. Um, if it was as easy as dumping a cup of bleach down the drain would kill all the bacteria, we could just do that for our septic systems, right? But we want to keep the good bacteria going, so we want to limit it. Um, you want to use the least amount of detergent that you need to get your clothes clean. So I just bought a, you know, a liquid detergent, and it says it does 100 loads on it. And then I took off the cap, and the cap is giant. I can't even hardly see the line about like how much I should use because it's so far down the bottom. But you know, the people selling laundry soap, they want me to use it, right? The more the merrier because then I'll buy some more. So um, often with a lot of the soaps now, they're also very concentrated. So again, I would start with half and see did your clothes get clean. You also need to be careful with powdered soaps. And I'm not saying you absolutely can't use powder. But some of the lower cost powdered soaps, they all contain fillers that make them flow. But some of the cheap ones, they use clay as the filler, and those little clay particles can travel through the tank and can plug up your soil. Uh, we do not recommend you use particularly a liquid fabric softener. So liquid fabric softeners contain petroleum. 
Uh, that's why, again, your clothes feel soft, is it's kind of coating the outside of your clothing with a layer of petroleum. Um, that petroleum can be toxic to the microbes and can cause the tank to not naturally stratify. So some more natural solutions would be using baking soda or vinegar, uh, dryer balls, an aluminum foil ball uh, will help with uh, static issues. So onto our kitchen where we use 11% of our water and you see hand washing here, right? But a full dishwasher uses less water than hand washing, right? Because you, you just don't use as much water overall. So when you're picking out detergents, make sure you're buying one that doesn't have phosphorus in it because there are some states that still do allow, including uh, Minnesota, that you can have phosphorus in your dishwashing detergent. Um, and scraping the plates, right? So uh, that we're not going to use our dishwasher as a garbage disposal. So in your sink, again, keep in mind that we want to limit the amount of solids going down the drain, making sure you don't have any leaks with that sink and all fats and oils are solid waste, right? You need to catch those and put them in your garbage or put them outside in your compost pile, whatever the case might be, they cannot go down the drain. And that doesn't matter if you're in the city, right? Or the country, if you're on a septic, um, no matter what, because they'll plug up lines uh, when they solidify. So what about that garbage disposal? So ultimately garbage disposals to me and Seth are, are, aren't a great idea. Uh, we just have a new kitchen and I had to basically fight with my builder to not have a garbage disposal put in. He's like, what do you mean you don't want one? I'm like, I don't want one. He's like, why not? And I'm like, I, I just don't need one. And it was funny because at the end of the day, he didn't put one in. Right, I'm paying for it. But he, there was, the electrician still wired a plug in because he doesn't believe me that someday I'm going to want one or maybe the next owners will. So the problem with a garbage disposal is it adds more solids, right? So when I eat a piece of broccoli, right, my body does a lot of decomposition of that. And when it comes out of me, out of me it doesn't look like broccoli anymore, right? When you put a raw piece of broccoli in there, now the microorganisms, they have to do all that digestion, right? I, I already made it into very small proteins and amino acids that they can continue to break down where that's not the case when they have to do all that pre-digestion too. Another big challenge is it's chopped into small pieces. Small pieces don't sell out as well. And then the last thing is you're adding water too. And the water is probably the smallest of the issues. So our recommendations are to not install one, don't use it if you have one. But keep in mind, if you live in Minnesota and other states, you're actually required to have a bigger system particularly a bigger septic tank. So that's gonna cost you more. So it's not just the cost of the disposal, it's the cost of the additional septic tank capacity. And if you actively use it, you will need to pump your tank more often. Cause some of the stuff we put down the drain that we don't eat, right, coffee grounds, they don't get digested in the septic tank either. So you'll just store more sludge and scum in that tank. So other sources of water that shouldn't go into the septic system, so if you have a sump pump, right, a tile line discharge, that should never go into your septic system. A dehumidifier discharge, um, in some states that can be a lot of water. High efficiency furnaces can cause freezing problems. Um, roof runoff, again, that can be a lot of water going towards your septic system. All those leaks, right, any other source of water that isn't sewage. So sewage is something that's come in contact with us, our clothes, our food, but if it hasn't, if it hasn't been contaminated, it doesn't need to go into the septic system. Another thing, um, hot tubs, right? Anything that's chemically treated can't go into the septic system either because the chemicals are put in there to kill bacteria and there would be a big hydraulic overload as well. So what about the water softener? This is probably one of the more common questions I get lately. And ultimately, this is where I want to start is at the top. The less chloride we put in your, into our septic system, the better. So chloride is a right salt. We use it to preserve things. Uh, so it's not great for bacteria. In small amounts, it's fine. But I would also start this conversation with the less chloride we put in the environment, the better. Um, so those of us who live in cold states like Minnesota, we use a lot of salt out on our roads and we're finding that salt out on our roads causes problems, right? It causes problems for our infrastructure, but it also causes problems for our water. We have a lot of impaired waters in Minnesota for chloride, which means the aquatic species that can live in that water, uh, some of them can't because we have too much chloride and chloride is very difficult to take out once we have it. 
And I think people have generally thought, yep, that's the rose petals. But we've actually found that there's a good percentage of that chloride that's actually coming from softening. So we want to be smart. If you have hard water, you, you need to soften your water because that can cause other problems. But we should be replacing older units. So again, if your water softener is as old as me, it's time for a new unit, right? It's time, and I'm really happy my husband doesn't say that, right? So you, because um, you will then, and when you put in that new unit, you want it to be based on the hardness of your water and actually set up for your hardness. Um, water softeners should be serviced um, approximately every five years. You should have your softener evaluated. And if possible, it would be best to route this out of your system. And for some people, that's a big change in their plumbing because it's plumbed right in. Um, it could go into a little separate, and when I say drain field, I'm not talking about a full-size drain field. I'm just talking about a little rock pit underground so it won't freeze. Um, it could technically run out on the surface in many states, but it could freeze. It can kill the grass. Um, and you also don't want that to run directly into a lake river stream. You don't want it to go towards your well because it does have salt in it. So a couple other water treatment devices, um, iron filters. Um, it is best to divert the backwash from iron filters out of septic systems whenever possible. How iron filters work is they actually take the iron that's dissolved and they make it into a solid that's filtered out. And then that filtrate goes if it goes to the septic system, it will have, and when I say chunks of iron, I'm talking about red ch chunks of iron, right? But it'll be this kind of iron solid. And if that's not possible, I would suggest pumping your tank more often. Reverse osmosis, as Craig mentioned, for every gallon of water made, there's approximately three gallons of wasted water, which is quite a bit, right? Three to one. And so if you're just doing that under your sink, that's not a big, it's not a big deal. But I've seen some whole home reverse osmosis systems. So there, let's say you were using 200 gallons a day, right? You may have as much as 600 extra gallons of water that is the backwash water. And our septic systems are not designed to handle that. So I mentioned before that septic systems make this beautiful smell, right? I'm the only person who thinks it's beautiful, right? So uh, that is the smell of hydrogen sulfide and methane. That Those gases I mentioned are designed to go out your plumbing stack. So if you can smell it, sometimes it's as easy as uh, the simple solution is to raise your stack. Particularly if you're in an area that's forested or in a valley, you may not have the wind patterns to take those gases away. Um, if it's something, again, you notice uh, particularly on hot, humid days when you're sitting out on your patio, you could try one of these charcoal or carbon filters. But if you live somewhere that's cold, like Minnesota, it will collect condensation, it'll freeze, and then you won't have septic odors outside, right? They will be in your house. So that's something that has to be taken off, which, you know, that's, that can be a, a hike, right, <laughs> up on your roof. So if it's inside, um, this could be that your vent is frozen or blocked, or if you have traps in your basement, or let's say you have a, you smell it, for instance, in that bathroom shower. It's often because the trap dried out. The water in the trap is what stops the gases from coming up. So another um, culprit can be if you have a sump pump that's pumping effluent, sewage effluent out. Um, those seals can sometimes leak gas. So you want to try to figure out uh, what's going on. So kind of lastly, if you're here in Minnesota, this is our septic system owner's guide uh, that's available through the university. It's just kind of a great reference document. If you live in another state, I guarantee you there's some information out there. But I've also found that the internet is full of information. And some of it is good, and some of it isn't. So finding a reputable source for information um, is, is a really good place to start. And that's why using you know, university websites, your state websites, your county websites as a place for information is better than just going to the Google because you can find an expert about just about anything on there. So to wrap this up and then we'll see if we've had some questions come in um, is what can you do to protect our water? And this image may look kind of small where some of you are sitting, but it kind of just shows how all of our water is connected. And that's true of our septic systems, and our agricultural practices that are kind of on the up left side of this picture, but also our city, right? So here we have a city that's using groundwater, right? And then taking that groundwater up, treating it, and putting it into a lake. So that needs to work too, right? Because one way or another, that water is either 
going into this deeper aquifer, or it could be feeding the lake, the stream, the wetland. And then that water is going to go back up, right? It's the sunlight and the evapotranspiration. So this is part of that overall hydrologic cycle. So what we can do again is, um, one, think about how much water we use. So conserve, uh, you know, whenever possible. Um, we want to properly operate. So we are the operators, right? But then also having maintenance done when needed to both our septic system and our wells. Our wells. Um, making sure you're properly disposing of unused pharmaceuticals and any hazardous waste. So there's programs where they will take those back. And ultimately, because you're all on this webinar, you're already part of this, right? You're informed, you're involved, but it's reaching out to other people in your community because often people don't understand how their practices, what they're doing in their home could be impacting our waters. So this last slide has a lot of additional re uh, resources. So the one you'll see at the top is the Minnesota Department of Health website. Uh, the next one is ours at the University of Minnesota, which again, you don't have to remember any of these, but you know, septic and University of Minnesota, it will come up. Um, our state regulatory agency here in Minnesota is the PCA, that is their uh, website. And also EPA has some really good information about chemicals of emerging concern. So this is an area that we are doing more investigation to try to determine um, at what level some of these chemicals um, are safe. 